question I get by atheists sometimes when I do debates, and I've done uh, 99 professors I've debated now, they'll say, well, doesn't the Green River Formation in Wyoming prove the Earth is millions of years old? There's a good article in one of the old creation magazines. I recommend a magazine. I disagree with a couple things on them, but, you know, disagree with everybody on something except me. But it's really good from uh, uh, Australia. They've got a good article about the Green River Formation, if you want to read that. There, uh, go to answersingenesis.org. You can get their uh, website. I get their, or, or the magazine, about 22 bucks a year, I think. The Green River Formation is a layer of rock in Wyoming that contains possibly hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of finely stratified layers. Well, if you go to our museum, you can get that little glass thing with two pieces of glass and different colored sand in between. You flip it over and it makes dozens and dozens of layers in a matter of a few seconds. Well, when they dig through the Green River, they'll say, here's a picture of the Green River Formation. They'll say, oh, each of these layers is a different season, and they go by the pollen. They say some have, there's certain pollen produced by trees in the spring. A different kind of tree produces pollen in the fall. And if you look at these layers, it's got the spring, fall, spring, fall, spring, fall. I mean, like maybe even a million times. And they call them annual layers because of the pollen. Well, the truth of the matter is, all those things would sort very rapidly, just like the thing in our museum does, sorts things very rapidly. Multiple, there's only two densities of sa colored sand in there, black and white, but it'll make, you know, 40 layers in a few seconds. Multiple layering, ma massive layering forms quickly. If you dig through this Green River formation, you find layers of ash in there from apparently a volcanic eruption. As they drill down through the ash, they count the number of layers between the two ash layers, the number of layers of Green River formation. And it's up to 35% difference in two different places. You drill one hole, you got 100 layers. You drill another hole, you only got, you know, 60 layers. What's, why would that be? You know, if those layers are really annual rings, then they should be consistent throughout the whole thing, and it's simply not. So get the article in Creation Magazine if somebody ever says to you, the Green River formation proves the Earth is millions of years old. It does not. And I get asked the question, maybe you've heard the question, what about the Mars rock? Is there really life on Mars? Like this article, you know, are we really Martians? There was a video a program when I was a kid called My Favorite Martian. It was kind of like Bewitched in one of those programs, you know. And the idea that there's been life on Mars has been around for, for decades. Here's a, uh, Percival Lowell's picture here showing him thinking about, boy, he said that Mars seems to be inhabited is not the last but the first word on the subject back 100 years ago. He said there might be life on Mars because of the canals. Well, the Mars rover went up there. They sent, I think, uh, I don't know how many have gone up there. Quite a few failed, you know. Good proof against evolution. But <laughs> then this machine, that multi-billion dollar machine, lands on Mars, tests the soil. Could not even find a trace of a germ on Mars. Now, Walt Brown says in his book, In the Beginning, if there's anything found on Mars, and there may be bacteria found on Mars, he says, he predicted that, it came from Earth during the flood when the fountains of the deep broke open. He says, the, he does all the physics and he's a physics professor, he said there would be enough pressure of 10 miles of rock pushing down on water to shoot things into orbit from Earth. That would then float around for you know a few hundred, few thousand years until they happen to get caught in a gravitational pull of whatever. And he thinks there might be stuff on Mars and it would have come from planet Earth. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a pretty convincing argument he makes for it. But there have been Two, 35 missions to Mars, two-thirds were complete or partial failures. Lots of money we spent trying to prove life on Mars. What's the purpose? Well, <clears throat> I think the whole purpose of the space program anymore is to prove evolution. They're trying desperately to prove God didn't do it. And if they can find life someplace else, well, then that's proof, you know, for evolution in their mind. This little rock you see a picture of here, sample ALH8401.0, this was the rock that they said proved there was life on Mars. Now, this rock was actually found near the South Pole. On that rock, there's a little wiggly line right there in the red circle. That little line, they said, looks like a fossilized bacteria. This is under a microscope, extremely highly magnified. And they said, see, that's proof there's life on Mars because here's a fossilized bacteria. Well, first place, Mars is quite a ways from the Earth, okay? I mean, quite a ways from the Earth. The closest they ever get in their orbits is about uh, one half astronomical unit, or about 45 million miles. That's the closest it ever gets. If we shrank all the planets down to the size of tomatoes, and Earth was a four-inch tomato, Mars would be a two-inch tomato. It's about half the diameter of Earth. And the closest it ever gets in its orbit would be about a third of a mile away at that scale. They say something hit Mars and knocked that rock over to Earth. 
Think about it. I want you to shoot a two-inch tomato so that a piece of it splatters a third of a mile and lands on a four-inch tomato. I think you're asking for, obviously, there should be some evidence of something hitting Mars that hard, like maybe a dent, you know. <laughs> there ought to be something to indicate. I think I blasted that hard to shoot something that far. But I don't buy the Mars rock at all. Well, basically what happened, that NASA was trying desperately to get their grant money through Congress. Congress was not about to vote for 20 bazillion more dollars for NASA to go look for, you know, life on Mars. They claim the rock came from Mars. They claim it broke off 16 million years ago, drifted around through space, and finally landed 13,000 years ago near the South Pole. That's the claim, okay? The truth of the matter is it was in a closet in NASA for about seven years, this rock was. My questions would be, what did this bacteria eat for these, you know, 16 million years while it's flying around through space? Uh, how did it survive the impact of the initial thing blasting it out, this vacuum of space, the re-entry? It's going to burn up coming through. It's going to remelt the whole rock coming through our atmosphere. It's going to melt the whole thing. Freezing for 13 years near the South Pole. As a NASA-funded team that did the research on the rock, and at the same time, NASA grant money was stalled in Congress. So what really was happening was they said, guys, you've got to find something important in this rock so that we can tell the people we've got to have more grant money. And Jonathan, when we did the radio program, oftentimes we'd read these articles about these, you know, this, the hidden agenda was always send more money for more research. You know, if only we had more money, we could do it. It's in just about every article in these science magazines. As soon as the announcement was made about the Mars rock, the grant money was released. Congress voted, yes, let's give NASA $40 bazillion, okay? A few months, a few months later, they studied the rock more and said, oh, that's not, that's not a bacteria. That's actually a crystal, a carbonate crystal, a naturally forming substance. Okay, we're sorry, folks. We'll keep looking, but thanks for the grant money. You know, they didn't, of course, they didn't return it after that. It's just a, simply a carbonate crystal that forms naturally on rocks. The Bible says, Eve's the mother of all living. I do not believe there's life on other planets. There is no evidence at all of any life on any other planet except right here on Earth. The question that frequently comes up is, what about theistic evolution? Couldn't God use evolution? Well, of course, that depends on what you mean by God. Okay. Osama bin Laden believes in God. He's certainly got a different God than I do. Okay. The Mormons believe in God. When they say our Heavenly Father, they're praying to Adam. We'll get into more Mormons in a minute. So what do you mean by God? The God that would use a process like evolution would be cruel, wasteful, and retarded. It is not the God of the Bible, that's for sure. It's not in the character of God to use an evil, mean process like evolution where bazillions of animals have to die in order for this things to improve. God is merciful. Evolution is cruel. It's not merciful. The weakest is destroyed in evolution, not protected. Jacques Monod, a Nobel Prize winner, said, Natural selection is the blindest and most cruel way of evolving new species and more complex organisms. The struggle for life and elimination of the weakest is a horrible process against which our whole modern ethics revolts. An ideal society is non-selective where the weak is protected, which is the opposite of the so-called natural law. He said, I'm surprised that a Christian would defend the idea that this is the process which God set up to have evolution. I'm surprised, too, that anybody would say God used evolution. What kind of God do they have anyway? He's mean, that's for sure. Um, philosopher David Hull said, Whatever the God implied by evolutionary theory and the data of natural history may be, He is not the Protestant God of waste not, want not. He is not even the awful God portrayed in the book of Job. The God of Galapagos is careless. Uh, he is wasteful. He's indifferent. He's almost diabolical. So this is not the God of the Bible, and I would have to agree. Charles Darwin in his book said, uh, From the war of nature, from famine, from death, the most exalted object we're capable of conceiving, the production of higher animals follows. See, in evolution, billions of things have to die in order to make the process work. One animal evolves a little better than the rest. The rest of them have to die, or the new improved genes are swamped back into the gene code. They're lost. But there are people who teach, you know, theistic evolution. The Bible says God's way is perfect. He made it right the first time. So I do not believe God would use evolution to get us here for several reasons. I think they're talking about a different God, okay? This is not the character of the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible doesn't do things that way, okay? The Bible says He made everything by His Word, and it was perfect. He made it all in six days. The Bible's real clear, and He rested on the seventh day. And He finished His works from the foundation of the world. So the Bible clearly teaches six days of creation rested the seventh day. Over and over it calls it the seventh day. And the Bible says real clearly that man brought death into the world. 
if theistic evolution is true, then death brought man into the world. Or death was here before man arrived, and the Bible says clearly man brought death into the world. And the Bible says we're made in God's image. So if the original created man was some kind of you know, animal that slowly evolved, then what does God look like? You know, is he a baboon? The fourth thing to consider, I think it's a retarded God that can't make it right first time. He's not worthy of worship, that's for sure. And it certainly, number four, nullifies the need for the death of Christ. And fifthly, and most importantly probably, there's no evidence for evolution anyway. So why should we take a perfectly good Bible, which has never been proven wrong, and compromise it with a stupid theory that's never been proven right? Everything about evolution is backwards to the Bible. Every single thing. Nothing matches. You can look at the chart there and see everything's backwards. The Bible says man brought death into the world. Evolution says death brought man into the world. The Bible says God created man. Evolution says man created God. Does evolution match the Bible? Absolutely not. It is a heresy to teach God used evolution. And a heresy is something against the clear teaching of Scripture. And I think there are people who are heretics today. I debated Hugh Ross, uh, Reasons to Believe. He's written several books. I've got uh, several of them right here. Creator in the Cosmos, Creation in Time, The Genesis Solution, uh, Creation in Time. He is a very nice man, a very smart man, and probably sincere, and probably really honestly loves the Lord in his own way. I do think he has a different God than I do, and I suspect that he's probably not a Christian in the biblical sense. He's got a mental acceptance of Christ, but not repentance and faith. That's just my theory. These four things right here, uh, ham, chicken, ribs, turkey, what do they all have in common? Well, they're all meats, they're all edible, and they all have bones in them. You have to learn early in life to eat the meat and spit out the bones, or you're going to choke on something, okay? That's just the way life is. If you don't learn that as a kid, you're going to die pretty early. And there are some good things you can learn, from, even from the heretics. They teach things that got some really good teaching in there. But you better spit out the bones. When I debated Hugh Ross, I asked him all kinds of questions. We've got the whole thing. Uh, John Ankerberg show taped it for us. And John Ankerberg now is a believer that the earth is billions of years old. And he's a friend of mine, nice guy, but I think that is pure heresy to teach that. In his book, Genesis Solution, right here, Hugh Ross, here's his testimony. He was a teenager reading through the Bible. He said, 18 months later, I arrived at Revelation 22. In other words, I finished the Bible. During those, 18, no, during those months, I read every passage and failed to discover anything I could honestly label as an error or contradiction. Some parts I had trouble understanding, but that didn't bother me. I understood enough, just as I understood enough physics and astronomy to trust what I was learning in my university courses. He was studying astronomy, and he became an astronomer in Canada, okay? PhD in astronomy. Now at the bottom he says, With some more delays and a little more wrestling with personal pride, I did make a transfer of trust, inviting God, the creator of the vast cosmos, to be my God, the master of my destiny, through Jesus Christ, his Son. Now, does that mean he got saved? I don't know. It looks to me, from what he still believes, that he has a mental acceptance of Christ. He is like, I would consider, a Catholic bishop or a pope who probably very sincere, very dedicated, and just simply doesn't understand repentance and faith. This is more of a mental acceptance rather than a uh, real salvation experience, I think. Now, I hope I'm wrong. I don't know who's going to heaven and who's not. I'm not saying he's going to hell. But I suspect he's not a Christian in the biblical sense, okay? I have a whole series. I debated Hugh Ross for three hours, and then we made a bunch of post-debate comments, and that's all available on our video series about the Hugh Ross debate. There's a great book by Jonathan Sarfati about Hugh Ross's heresies. Now, Sarfati's a brilliant guy. He lives in Australia, and I love reading his stuff. I think he's wrong on a couple things, you know. Certainly, his thinking about the King James is wrong, but we can deal with that some other time. It's, it's possible to believe in God and still not be saved. James 2.19 says the devils believe and tremble. They believe. They're not saved. They have a head knowledge, but not a heart knowledge. Uh, Matthew 7, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Not everybody who claims they're a Christian really is. Okay. What about some of the other religions? I think theistic evolution probably would be a false religion as opposed to a branch of Christianity. But there are quite a few other religions. I'm going to cover a lot of this in our college class, so I'm going to skip most things for now. I won't cover them all now, just to hit a few highlights. But in our college class in the 200 series, we will cover a lot of other religions. I mean, there's a lot of religions out there. Who's right? Well, obviously, the independent Baptists are right. You know, when you get done climbing the mountain of truth, that's, you know, fine. That they're sitting there all along. Uh, did you figure that out yet, Derek, that the independent Baptists are the ones that are right? You're not quite there yet. You're still climbing? Still climbing. Okay. Uh, so I'm not against other religions. I'm simply for truth and against error. 
And if the Catholics teach something that is right, I'll say, yay, you're right. If my mother teaches something that is right or wrong, I'll say, yay, that's right, that's wrong. You don't ever want to get committed to a denomination or committed to, a, to any one thing other than truth. So I'm for truth and against error. And the Bible says in Ephesians, you've got to be careful about being carried away with every wind of doctrine. When religions differ on things, if somebody must be wrong. Of course, maybe they're both wrong. But at least one of them has to be wrong, okay, if there's a difference. So, he that cometh first in his own cause seemeth just, it says in Proverbs. And a young person, the first time they hear somebody talk about a religion, they say, oh, well, that sounds good. Well, you better search it out. I remember the first time I heard the teachings of uh, the Jehovah's Witness. As he, I was a brand new Christian. I got reading some of their stuff. I said, wow, that seems right. Until I studied it, wow, that's not right. So, and that's the danger of any young person can be trapped because the first time you hear something, oh, wow, that sounds good. You better really search it out. We had uh, here on staff, one of the guys had a book that he was giving out, you know, to everybody, and it sounded really good, but it was written by some of the heretics of the first century. So, said, well, you better really study this out. It seems right at first until you say, oh, wait a minute, is that true? Uh, it's interesting, if you read Genesis 27, Jacob and Esau, you know, how Jacob tricked his father. The father went by the feeling instead of by the word. He said, you sound like Jacob, but you feel like Esau. So he gave him Esau's blessing. And it's, the reason he got tricked is precisely because he went by the feeling. The Mormons will tell you they know they're right because when they prayed about Mormonism, they got a burning in the bosom. They got a feeling, of, oh, wow, this feels right. Well, just kneeling down and praying to anything will give you that burning feeling. Oh, and just a reverence of kneeling down praying to this rock. <laughs> that doesn't mean it's right, okay? And that's their whole thinking. It's all based on feeling. A lot of the charismatics do the same stuff. You know, they have this feeling like, oh, wow, I just feel like I should, you know, do this. We got the demonstration in the science center about the, you blindfold the person on the chair that spins. Any of you ever done that thing? Sit down there, get blindfolded, spin you around. Within 30 seconds, you feel like you're not spinning, even though you still are. And then when you stop the person, they feel like they're turning the other way, even though they're not turning at all. And that's how pilots crash their planes, because they go by their feelings and not by what does the gauge say. So I am not anti any other religion. I'm simply for truth and for the Bible and against error. So keep that in mind. And you've got to be careful about going on feelings. What about the Sabbath? Well, I get asked probably every week. I get books sent to me. I've got a whole section of our library by probably every book ever written by any Seventh-day Adventist, and they're all trying to convert me over to being a Seventh-day Adventist. And they send me all kinds of stuff, and don't send me any more. I've already got them all, okay? I don't need any more. I've got lots of books, all the books by Ellen G. White, E.G. White, okay, who wrote, and she was the prophetess of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm not anti-Seventh-day Adventist. I've spoken at some of their churches. And there's a lot of good folks, love the Lord, genuinely saved, going to heaven as much as I am. But what is the truth about the Sabbath? Are we supposed to, you know, work on the seventh, rest on the seventh day? Is that the day of worship or the day of rest? Or what is the truth about the Sabbath? Well, Nehemiah chapter 9 uh, it says, Thou camest down upon Mount Sinai, and spakest uh, with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments, true laws, good statutes, and madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath. Wait a minute, this is Nehemiah talking about the time Moses received the Sabbath from God. That's 2,500 years after the creation. See, I don't have Moses even on that chart, but 2,500 years after the creation, God made the Sabbath known to Moses. You mean for 2,500 years, for more than a third of human history, nobody kept this? Apparently so. He revealed it to Moses. He said in Exodus 16, See that the Lord hath given you the seventh day. Every man abide in his place. Don't go out of your house on the Sabbath day. Well, if that's really one of the laws for the Sabbath, then you can't have a seventh day church that meets someplace because everybody's going out of their house to get there. All right? They talk about a Sabbath day's journey in Acts chapter 1. Jesus traveled on the Sabbath, okay? What's he doing out of his house? The Bible says, Remember the Sabbath, in it thou shalt not do any work. Don't you do it, nor your son, nor your maidservant, nor the stranger. Not only can you not work, you can't make anybody else work. Which means if you really want to honor and obey the Sabbath, according to Scripture, you cannot work and you can't make anybody else work, which means you cannot use any utilities. Because if you're using the city water, the city lights, the city gas, you're making somebody work. If you're watching TV, you're making somebody work on the Sabbath. If you go out to eat, you're making somebody work. You can't do that. So he rested the seventh day. The Bible says if they worked on the seventh day, Exodus 31, they'd be put to death. So you've got to kill people that work on the Sabbath. It's punishable by death. Exodus 31 is a key passage on this. The Lord said unto Moses, Speak thou unto the children of Israel, saying, My Sabbaths ye shall keep. 
it is a sign between me and you. The children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. I mean, it's right there, Exodus 31. It's pretty clear. The Sabbath was for the children of Israel. I'm Norwegian. Sabbath, God made some strange rules for the children of Israel because they were to be a peculiar people. People were to look at them and say, wow, that's strange. What's different about you guys? And they were to be a testimony to the world. But he didn't command all the world to keep this. He said, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. It's pretty clear in Exodus 31. Exodus 35 says, you shall kindle no fire, which means you couldn't start your car. Don't they run on internal combustion? You know, you're starting a fire. So if you really want to keep the Sabbath, you can enjoy yourself. I've never met anybody, anybody who keeps the Sabbath. Never met one person. Okay? The elders of Israel, he said in Ezekiel 28, he says, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them. The Sabbath is for the children of Israel. Again, it tells us in Ezekiel chapter 20. Jesus was on the Sabbath day going through the corn. He plucked the corn because they were hungry and they ate it. First of all, what's he doing out of his house? And what's he doing working on the Sabbath day? Did he not keep it? The Bible says in Mark chapter 2, uh, the Pharisees said, Why do you do that which on the Sabbath which is not lawful? And he said, The Sabbath was made for man, not man made for the Sabbath. What's he doing out of his house and what's he doing working on the Sabbath? Jesus said in Mark 3, It's lawful to do good on the Sabbath day, to save life. And they looked about, they got angry at him for his answer. And people today get angry at me because I don't keep what their idea of the Sabbath is. I say, look, I, I keep every day as holy. I work seven days a week for the Lord. My whole life is soaked up into God's work. I do nothing else. <laughs> this is it. So people say, do you, you keep the Sabbath? Oh, yeah. And, and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. I keep them all. Yeah, I keep them all. <laughs> do them all. Jesus went outside on the Sabbath. He took his disciples with him. What's he doing? Making them sin. He picked corn. He healed people. He got angry at the hypocrites. He's not resting and being refreshed, that's for sure. He's getting angry at the hypocrites on the Sabbath. So there's a book. I don't know that I can highly recommend it, but I recommend it. If you can read past uh, Peter Ruckman's uh, rude, crude, crass, mean-spirited uh, technique of writing. Adam, you know all about, about that. He's got some brilliant logic in here. It's $2 for the book. We offer it. We don't sell it on the website. We don't advertise it. But if you want more, he's got brilliant logic and real abrasive, I think, unnecessarily so. But it's good, good logic on why he's not a Seventh-day Adventist. If you want to get that, you can get it. So I, if you want to keep the Sabbath, you just enjoy yourself. But it's interesting, in Romans 13, he listed some of the commandments. O no man, anything but to love one another. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, like the Sabbath, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He didn't list the Sabbath here in Romans 13. The first day of the week, the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. And I know there's arguments back and forth of which day are we supposed to meet on. I don't care, okay? Most churches meet on Sunday. I don't think they call it a day of worship, though some do. It's the day that they meet. The Sabbath was not designed to be a day of worship. It was designed to be a day of rest. You worship God all seven days. You rest one, that's all. If you want to rest Saturday, that's fine. So the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. It's a New Testament tradition that they met on the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16, on the first day of the week, let everybody lay by in store. Come bring your tithes and offerings in. Uh, that's when most churches meet, okay? Let no man judge you in meat or drink or holy days or the Sabbath. Don't let anybody tell you you're wrong on that. Okay, people say, well, didn't the Pope accept evolution? Yes, they have several times. The Popes have accepted evolution and many people have gotten upset. There have been at least three or four, I think, articles about the Popes have accepted evolution as a fact. This uh, Catholic nun said, people who believe this creation myth, which is unscientific and not in the Bible, despite what they say, haven't really studied theology. I don't know how a nun can be that dumb. If you don't think the creation story is in the Bible, <laughs> what is she reading? Okay. By the way, you want to do some interesting study. Read the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, and then go to any Catholic church and say, Hey, do you guys have the Ten Commandments? Oh, yeah. They'll give you a copy of them. They left out the second one about don't make a graven image. Their Ten Commandments skip commandment number two, and they take commandment number ten and split it into two commandments to make nine and ten. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house. Which really was one commandment. Why wouldn't they want the real one in there that says, don't make a graven image? Because their church is full of graven images, okay? So, back in the uh, 1400s, if you committed certain sins, you could pay money to the priest and be absolved, get your sins forgiven. If you robbed a church, you'd have to pay $2.25. Here's the list of what they had to pay to get out of their sin. 
If you burn a house, you got to pay two seventy-five. If you kill a layman, buck seventy-five. If you forge forgery or lying, two bucks. If you eat meat in Lent, two seventy-five. If you ravish a, ravish a virgin, two bucks. If you strike a priest, two seventy-five. Same as burning a house. Robbery, three bucks. Keeping a priest that keeps a mistress can do so if he pays two twenty-five. Okay. Procuring an abortion is a dollar fifty. Murder of parents or wife, two fifty. You can be absolved of all crimes by paying twelve bucks. <laughs> That's What's the way to describe that? Stupid? Is that the best way to describe that? Okay. I'm not anti-Catholic, okay? I'm for truth. I'm against error. That is error to say paying money pays for your sins. And it's error to say burning a candle pays for your sins. And it's error to say, priest, Father, I have sinned, you know, and you, would you please absolve me of my sins? That's error. The Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin, nothing else. So I'm not anti-Catholic. I'm simply... Uh, for truth and against error. Keep that thought in mind. Here's a picture of the Pope kissing the Koran. The Catholic Catechism in our library out here, you can read it for yourself. Some of the things they believe are pretty interesting. They say in the Catholic Catechism, uh, 841, the church's relationship with the Muslims is the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator, the first place among whom are the Muslims. These profess to hold the faith of Abraham, and together with us, they adore the one merciful God. There's an excellent little bitty comic book called The Prophet you can get from our ministry. It's like $2 or something like that uh, by Jack Chick. He goes through the history of the Muslim church and how they started. Very few people realize it was the Catholics that started Islam. They started the whole religion purposely to try to get the Holy Land back for the Catholics. They built up the Islam. <clears throat> they, they funded Muhammad. They trained him. They sent a Catholic nun out of the monastery. They said, we want you to come out of your co convent, go find a young promising uh, Muslim, marry him, and train him to raise up an army of Arabs to go take back the Holy Land for the Mother Church. Quite an interesting story if you want to read about that. It, it started to work, but then it failed because the Islam got so big, they said, well, forget you Catholics, we're doing what we want. And I don't think most Muslims, which is now, what, 10, 20% of the world population, Islam, I don't think most of them know that they really started off as a front for the Catholic Church. So let's cover just a little bit on Muslims. Ask the Muslims, you know, how do you know, <clears throat> how do you know Muhammad was a prophet? They'll say, well, he had a mole on his back. Holy moly. That's, that's how you know he's a prophet because he's got a mole on his back. I've got a mole on my back. Got one right here on my cheek. Man, I must be a double prophet. Got two moles. Albert, you got any moles? Yeah. You, well, wow, bow down and worship Albert, you know. In uh, one of the Muslim verses says, uh, <clears throat> Muhammad asks the question, When I am dead and buried in the ground and go back to dust, is that all? What will happen to me? Muhammad himself had no clue if he was going to heaven. This uh, verse in, in the Quran says, When he reached the setting of the sun, he found it set in a pond of murky water. Would that be scientifically accurate to say the sun sets in a pond of murky water? No. I would say this, the earth turns around and the sun you know, appears to go around the earth. This is not scientifically accurate. The Koran has loads of scientific errors. It's not a holy book. Allah commands any person who leaves Islam <clears throat> or encourages others to do so should be seized and slain. There are over 100 commands in the Koran to kill people who won't convert. Anybody that won't convert has to be killed. And I see Bush and these guys saying, you know, we're trying to bring democracy in Iraq. And the problem with Iraq is their religion. They are being taught every couple days in the synagogue, you've got to kill anybody who won't convert. <clears throat> and there probably are millions of Muslims who don't like this and they don't want to do that, but they just, in order to be a good Muslim, you have to kill anybody else who will, won't become Muslim. That's the rules, okay? Islam is a religion where God requires you to send your son to die for him. The Bible is where God sent his son to die for you. <laughs> exactly the opposite, okay? If you study the history of Jerusalem and the problems with Islam, it's phenomenal. Keep in mind, they both come from the two sons of Abraham. Abraham, if he wouldn't have gone down into Egypt and got that Egyptian girl and had that one baby Ishmael, we wouldn't have this whole problem because all the Arabs come from Ishmael. And the price of gas would not be over two bucks a gallon if it hadn't been for Abraham and Hagar, okay? Probably more if the Jews had control of all of it. They like money too. But 
the Romans and Byzantines, you know, trampled uh, the city of Jerusalem. Uh, Chuck Missler's got all kinds of stuff on the uh, Jerusalem and the, the problems they've had with Islam over the years. It's been trampled down by the Gentiles. The Bible says, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all people. And we've got a ton of stuff in our college class CSE 200 series about Islam. One of the books we sell in our bookstore, and I don't get off into every single religion there is, but Islam is a growing, powerful religion, and you need to study it, is this little book, but who is this Allah? On page 27, he says, The last hour will not come before the Muslims fight the Jews and the Muslims kill them. That's their plan. Uh, the purest joy in Islam is to kill and be killed for Allah. After killing tens of thousands of non-Muslims in Iran, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini said, In Persia, no people have been killed so far, only beasts. Because he thought they're not Muslims, so they're not really people. Uh, Allah created Adam, making him 60 cubits tall, according to Bahara, volume 4. That's 90 foot tall. I mean, is that, you believe that? Adam was 90 feet tall? In the third serve, verse 105, it says, In the great and final redemption, only white faces shall be saved. All black faces will be condemned. In other words, you've got to be white to go to heaven, to the Muslim heaven. Okay? In the fourth serve, it says, Mary, Men, marry as many women as you like, one, two, three, or four. In Islam, they tell the people you can have four wives, but only four. So what they'll do is they'll get three wives, and then the fourth one, they have what they call uh, convenience marriages. You can marry somebody for 15 minutes and then divorce them. So you can have all the concubines you want. Oh, I was only married 15 minutes. There's no law against that. That's their law. It says you can do that. In uh, volume 1, it says, uh, Abu reported, When any of you wakes from sleep, he performs ablution. He must cleanse his nose, clean his nose three times. For the devil spends the night in the interior of the nose. Good Muslims will get up in the morning, suck water into their nose, and blow it back out three times. That's got to hurt. Why? Well, because the devil lives in your nose. While you're sleeping, the devil crawls in. That's what they teach, okay? Uh, Bakara, volume 4, says that Satan stays in the upper part of the nose all night. Well, guess what expression we get from that? The boogeyman, right? Uh, the boogeyman. Allah report, or Abdu reported, the apostle Allah said, people should avoid lifting their eyes toward the sky while supplicating in prayer. Otherwise, their eyes would be snatched away. If you're praying and you look up, your eyes will be popped out of your head. He reported, uh, Muslims, non-Muslims eat in seven intestines while a Muslim eats in one. Is there a biological difference between non-Muslims and Muslims? Do non-Muslims have seven intestines? You studied anatomy. Adam, is that in there? They've pretty much the same. If you do an autopsy, I bet you'd find they're the same. Uh, Don Boyes, my friend up in Chattanooga, Tennessee area, has written a great book called Islam, America's Trojan Horse. His website's fabulous too, CST. Common Sense Today, news.com. You can read about uh, more about Islam. Got a lot of, he's really re received some flack for even writing the book. Okay? What about Mormons? What do they believe? Are they a Christian religion? Joseph Smith said, I see no faults in the church, and therefore let me be resurrected with the saints. Whether I ascend to heaven or descend to hell or go to any other place, if we go to hell, we will turn the devils out of doors and make a heaven out of it. When this pe where these people are, there is good society. What do we care where we are if the society be good? Joseph Smith didn't know if he was going to heaven or hell, by the way. God made Aaron to be a mouthpiece to the children of Israel, and he will make me be God to you in his stead. If you don't like it, you must lump it. <laughs> That's what Joseph Smith said. Joseph Smith said, There are men living on the moon who dress like Quakers and live to be nearly a thousand years old. Well, we've been to the moon a bunch of times now. Are there Quakers up there? This is scientifically inaccurate, okay? He's wrong. Uh, official Mormon doctrine is someday we get to become God. The Mormons teach as, as we are, Adam or God once was, God used to be a man, and as God is, we shall be. And they think Adam became God. So when they pray, Heavenly Father, they're praying to Adam. There's some good books we offer here you can get on Mormonism. The Secret History of the Mormon Church is excellent. This shows some of the history of how people have been killed trying to leave Mormonism. Because if you start speaking out against Mormonism or try to leave the religion, I mean, in the old days especially, you'd get killed. they just find you dead someplace in the middle of the, you know, desert. If you want to read more on that. Mormonism, a way that seemeth right, is also good. It's nothing but questions for Mormons. 
There's one we offer by Thomas Hines, uh, Answers to My Mormon Friends, if you want to read up on that. There's a good book, the red one, Mormonism, Mama and Me. This is the more gentle approach. It's uh, just a grandma type, hey, honey, you know, do you really believe that? Now, why is that? It's kind of a, a softer, gentler approach to reaching Mormons, if you want to. The ultimate authority on Mormons that I have seen is uh, Gerald and Sandra Tanner in Utah, Salt Lake City, utlm.org, Utah Lighthouse Mission. This is real fine print of everything you ever wanted to know and a whole lot more <laughs> on Mormonism. It is phenomenal, the stuff that the Mormons believe. Joseph Smith forged the book. Somebody else had taken a book to the printer to get printed. It was a, a Baptist who got mad at his church, and he wrote a story about, it was a novel, actually. Well, Joseph Smith apparently got that, the draft copy. We have on CD available here, if you want to get it, the actual photocopies of the pages that he took to the printer and said, this is what I want printed. Supposed to be the most perfect book on earth. He said he got these special seer stones that he would put these golden plates that he got from the angel Moroni. He put them in a hat. He'd look in there with the seer stone and he had a curtain beside him and he would read to his friend, Hiram, I believe it was, who, who wrote down everything. When he got done writing all this through the curtain, Hiram never got to see the golden, nobody ever got to see the golden plates. Nobody, except Joseph. He told people about it, okay? There were no golden plates. But he said he translated it through this special seer stone because it was written in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. It was, he's reading the text of this book that he stole from the printer, apparently, okay? And when he got all done writing it, they took it to the printer to get printed. They said it's the most perfect book, book ever written. It came straight from God. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of mistakes in it and corrections. If you want to see the actual one, call our office. We'll have the CD available. I got it in my office stack up in Pavel. You can, we can produce those on Mormonism. So I'm not anti-Mormon. I'm for truth and against error, and what they teach is error. We've got a ton of stuff on Mormonism if you want to read it. Uh, Lucy Max Smith said, Joseph uh, was running through the woods at the top of his speed for three miles with the gold plates tucked under his arm. And three people came out, and he had to knock three different people down. While he's running with these plates, full blast, with the plates under his arm, golden plates, three people attacked him. He knocked them down with one hand and kept running to the house. The size of the golden plates, this is a picture of what they would have been. This is one that uh, the tanners have in their museum of the golden plates of the size that Joseph Smith said they were. This is out of lead. Now, gold is a lot heavier than lead. The golden plates, that size, the dimensions were given several times, and in in Joseph Smith told them how wide they were, etc. They would weigh 230 pounds. Paul, you lift weights a lot. Can you run with 230 pounds under one arm? No. They have a competition in New York every year. I forget what they call it, but they bring all these bodybuilders and huge muscle guys in and say, let's see who can run three miles carrying these plates under their arm. They've got a huge prize for anybody who can do it. The farthest anybody's made it with under one arm is 75 feet. That's walking, carrying 230 pounds under one arm. Good luck, okay? I don't buy that story that Joseph Smith told. I think he's lying, okay? Questions. Why did Joseph Smith try to join the Methodist Church in 1828 when in 1820 the Lord told him all of the churches were wrong and they were an abomination? Why? Just questions. The book uh, Mormonism, A Way That Seemeth Right is mostly just questions. It's here, in the, here we go. Now, I would differ with these guys on several things, okay? I, I'm not promoting everything they believe, but this book is well done. It's just simply questions to ask Mormons. Like, why does your one book say you have to have more than one wife to be saved, and your other book says if you have more than one wife, you're damned? Which is it? You know, just obvious contradictions in the Mormon religion. And again, I'm not anti-Mormon. I'm for truth and against error. Why weren't the three witnesses in the book to the Book of Mormon taken to Joseph Smith's house and show him the golden plates? Why did he only take them to the woods and they saw the plates in a vision? Nobody ever saw those golden plates. The Book of Mormon says the final battle between the Nephites and Lamanites was on the hill Camara in New York. Well, there had been nothing ever found there, no evidence at all found of a battle where millions died. There are a couple of great DVDs out now called The Bible versus the Book of Mormon and um, DNA versus the Book of Mormon. Did you get to see either of those, Jonathan? Oh, they're, all, they're in the library if you want to check those out. Okay. According to the claims of Mormon, the Lord led three groups of people from, to America from the Middle East, uh, the Jaredites, the Nephites, and the Molochites. There's no evidence of any of these ever been found. 
Nothing. There is no archaeological evidence to back up the Book of Mormon. So if you want to study Mormonism, I'd recommend those two DVDs that just came out in 2005 about the serious problems with the Book of Mormon. And again, there are millions, I think like 10 million people now follow Mormonism. Some very good, sincere, honest, intelligent people who have just been absolutely duped, deceived, tricked, lied to. Why would Joseph Smith admonish his people not to drink wine or strong drink and then attempt to construct a bar in the Mason House, Mansion House, and only reneged when his wife Emma declared, either that bar goes or I go? Why is he doing that? Bruce McConkie said, Thus the name's titles of signify our Lord is the only Son of the Father in the flesh. Christ was begotten by an immortal, immortal Father in the same way that mortal men are begotten by mortal fathers. Is that correct? Was Christ the physical son? Or, uh, this is heresy, okay? He was born in the same personal, real, and literal sense that any mortal son is born to a mortal father. That's what the Mormons teach. Now remember, from the time forth and this time forth and forever, Jesus Christ was not begotten by the Holy Ghost, it says in the book, Journal of Discourses. Mormonism is not a Christian religion. They, it's a cult in every sense of the word. There are all kinds of errors in what they teach. We'll cover more on that in our college class. What about Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, we could spend two days on Jehovah's Witnesses. I just recommend you get the book, Answers to My Jehovah's Witness Friends. There are other ministries that deal just with that. There's a good little pamphlet you can get, 15 Reasons Why I'm Not a Jehovah's Witness. Here's the address on the screen. You can get McGregorMinistries.org. There are people who have taken, you know, God has led it on, on their heart to, you know, witness to the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they, they're very sincere, really duped. One of the craziest religions on the planet has got to be Jehovah's Witness. As I go speak on creation and evolution, and especially when I do debates, there's always somebody during Q&A time at the university that says, there are contradictions in the Bible. As a brand new Christian, age 16, I went to the Methodist church camp one more time because I'd been going to the Baptist church. But at the Methodist church camp where I had been going before, the counselor sat us boys down on the bed and said, hey, hey guys, who are you? you know, how old are you? Where do you live? Etc. And we told him our names. We're all sitting around in the bunks there. And he said, well, my name is whatever it was, George or something. He said, I'm a student at University of Illinois and I want you to know I'm a humanist. Well, I didn't know what a humanist was. So I said, does that mean you believe in humans? He said, well, I do believe in humans, but no, that's not what that means. He said, uh, I said, well, do you believe the Bible? He said, well, the Bible's a good book, but it has lots of errors. Now, I had only been saved for a few months, but I was smart enough to know because my preacher told me, if anybody ever says the Bible's full of errors, hand them your Bible and say, show me one. So I handed him my Bible and says, well, show me one. He said, I'll be glad to. Here's what he showed me. Genesis chapter 1. The Bible says pretty clearly in chapter 1, the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed and fruit trees. This happened on the third day. The counselor said, Kent, when did God make the trees? I said, day three. He said, all right. Verse 20, day five. Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth. He said, Kent, when did God make the birds? I said, day five. He said, what did he make the birds out of? I said, well, it looks like he made them out of the water. Correct. You know, he made Adam out of the dirt, made Eve out of a rib, made the birds out of the water. That's what it says, okay? Verse 24, let the earth bring forth the living creature. He said, now Kent, what did God make the creatures out of? I said, he made them out of the earth, he made the birds out of the water, made the animals out of the dirt. And then he made man. He said, that's chapter 1. Now look at chapter 2. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And the Lord God made grow every tree. He said, wait, wait, wait. I thought the trees were made on day three and man on day six. Here we have the man made and then the trees after man, which is correct. Were the trees made before man or after man? Have you ever been in an argument with somebody and you, you knew you're losing? You've been, you married guys know about that. You just know, you know, I'm losing this argument. Okay, you might as well stop right now, all right? You might as well just quit. Verse 18. The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meat for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. Oh, here we got two problems. You got the animals made after man, and you got the birds made after man, and the birds are made out of the ground instead of out of the water. He said, Kent, the Bible's a good book, but it's got lots of contradictions. Just in the first two chapters, did the 
Chapter 1 say the grass plants trees made on day 3. Chapter 2 has plants and trees made after man on day 6. Chapter 1 has birds made out of the water on day 5. Chapter 2 has birds made out of the ground on day 6. Chapter 1 has animals made before man. Chapter 2 has animals made after man. He said the Bible's a good book, but it's not God's Word. I'd only been saved a couple of months and I was crushed in my faith. It seems to happen to every young Christian. Satan sends somebody along to destroy their faith and get them derailed. Well, that got me, I'll tell you what. The rest of that week is camp, at camp, I was a defeated young Christian. Well, I wish I could find that guy today. I can answer his question now, okay? Here's what happened. On the third day, God made the plants, okay, grass, plants, trees. On the fifth day, He made the birds out of the water. On the sixth day, He made the animals, and then He made man, and then He made the garden and put the man in the garden. Now, all of chapter 2 is describing what happened in the garden only. It's not describing the whole world. God made more trees, and it's only the two kinds, the trees that are good for food and the trees that are good to the sight. Beautiful garden. The rest of the world's already full of trees. He's describing what happened in the garden. And then he made one more of each animal so that Adam could name them and select a wife. And so while Adam's standing there, up out of the ground is coming one more of each animal. Now the rest of the world's already full of animals. This is just for Adam to see God do it and to make a wife and to create a wife, to, to select a wife. Up comes a giraffe. He says, giraffe, no thanks. You know, hippopotamus, no thanks. You know, elephant, no thanks. Hamster, no thanks. You know, one by one, Adam names all the animals and rejects them as a wife. And then the Lord says, Adam, go to sleep, son. I've got a surprise for you when you wake up. Put Adam to sleep, took one rib and made the world's first loudspeaker. Uh, I mean, the world's first woman. Okay. And uh, so this is only describing what's happening in the garden. Now, it's interesting. If you look at the sequence here. Adam actually saw God create things. Eve never saw that. Suppose God had made Adam last. Satan could walk in and say, Hey, Adam, how do you like this beautiful garden I made? And Adam would have doubts the rest of his life. Well, who really made this? I don't know. I trust you, God, but I don't know. He w there's no way he could know. Now, the fact is, Eve never saw God create anything. So who did Satan go to to trick? Eve the weaker vessel, 1 Timothy says. So that's what happened. There are no contradictions in the Bible. Chapter 1 and chapter 2 are both fine. The Bible says in 1 Timothy, Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Adam knew full well what he was doing. When she walked up and handed him that banana or whatever it was, say it's an apple, I don't know, we don't know, it's a fruit, okay? He said, oh, brother, Eve, you blew it. He looked at that, he knew if I don't become sin, for her, God's going to have to kill her. I think Adam, knowing full well what he was doing, voluntarily took that fruit, ate it, and said, God, whatever you do to her, you got to do it to me too. That's what I think. Just like Jesus Christ voluntarily became sin for us so that he could save us and we could become the bride of Christ. That'll preach. Okay, as a young Christian, I was reading my Bible and came across Second Chronicles chapter 4. And it says, Solomon made a great sea of ten cubits from brim to brim, and five cubits the height thereof, and a line of thirty cubits did compass it about. I read that, I set my Bible down on my bed, and I said, Lord, this is wrong. If it's ten cubits across, it's not thirty cubits around. Anybody that studies mathematics knows to find the circumference of a circle, it's diameter times pi 3.14159265. I said, it should not be 30 cubits around. It should be 31 point, you know, 415, nine cubits around. Why did he say 30 cubits around? I thought there was an error in the Bible and I was going to quit Christianity. And I read the passage and read it and read it and read it and said, wait a minute, wait, 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 I'm missing something here. Verse 5 says it was a hand breadth thick. That's a lot of brass, that thick. And the brim of it was like the work of the brim of a cup. There are two theories of how to solve this supposed contradiction. One theory says it was 10 cubits outside to outside, not counting the thickness of the brass. Now that'll work. If you take 10 cubits, elbow to fingertip, subtract two hand breadths, and calculate backwards, you'll get a value of pi for the inner circumference of 3.14159. It'll work fine. You can give it a try. The other theory is that it says it had a brim like a cup. The bowl went up and had a brim coming out. So it's 30 cubits around the bowl but 10 cubits across brim to brim, counting the little lip sticking out like most cups are bent out just a little bit. Either theory would probably solve the problem. No, there are no contradictions. So First Kings says, 
Solomon made this molten sea that held 2,000 baths. A bath is about eight gallons. Yet Second Chronicles says it held 3,000 baths. Well, was it 2,000 baths or 3,000 baths? By the way, 3,000 baths, 24,000 gallons, is a small to mid-sized swimming pool. Okay, it's the kind you put in your backyard. That's a 24,000-gallon pool. That's a lot of water or oil or whatever they're going to put in this thing. Well, Second Chronicles says it held 3,000 baths. First Kings says it contained 2,000 baths. Is that a contradiction? No, it's not full. It's two-thirds full, okay? It could hold 3,000, but it's only got 2,000 in it. How many horses did Solomon have? This is a contradiction the atheists always bring up. First Kings says Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Second Chronicle says Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Well, which is it, 40,000 or 4,000? Now, we sell on our website the Defender's Bible by Henry Morris. I love Henry Morris and the Defender's Bible. He's a good personal friend of mine and his son, John Morris, good friend of mine. Love what they're doing. In the Defender's Bible, he's got a footnote right here that says this is a copyist error. He says, this number is given as 4,000 in Second Chronicles. This is best explained as a copyist error. Well, I read that, and I wrote a letter to Henry Morris and said, Brother, I love you. I sell your Bible, but I'm going to have to put a disclaimer in the front page. You have a mistake. Actually, quite a few mistakes in your footnotes. And so I have a one-page disclaimer that goes with our Defender's Bible that we sell. They've got to stack up in shipping if you want to read it that says, uh, we love Henry Morris. He's got many good notes in here, but like anything, you've got to eat the meat and spit out the bones. He's wrong about this one. There is not a copyist error. Both of those verses are absolutely fine. Read them carefully. Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots. Does that tell me how many chariots he had? No. That, tell me how, that tells me how many horses he had for the chariots, right? For Second Chronicles. And Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots. Oh, now that's, that's different. Apparently he had stalls for the keep the horses and chariots, and he had other stalls just for the horses for the chariots. Well, if they had 40,000 stalls of horses for the chariots, and he had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots, they had 10 horses per stall. 10 horses per chariot. I'm sorry. Not a contradiction at all. King James got it exactly correct. Ten horses per chariot. They would never put one horse per chariot. I mean, one arrow takes out the whole tank. They had chariot teams, actually. NIV got it wrong. New American Standard got it right. I collect other Bible versions. I got a bunch of them here. Uh, <clears throat> New Revised Standard got it wrong. How many men did David kill? 700 or 7,000. Well, look at the passages carefully. The Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew the men of 700 chariots of the Syrians. First Chronicles, David slew of the Syrians 7,000 men which fought in chariots. Well, which is it? 700 or 7,000? Read it carefully. Again, Henry Morris has a footnote here that says this is a copyist error. No, I'm sorry, Henry, it is not a copyist error. Both verses are fine. Look at them carefully. If he slew the men of 700 chariots, and he slew 7,000 men which fought in chariots, what does that mean? Ten men per chariot. They had ten men and ten horses. They had chariot teams. You go out, you fight for a while, you come back, you swap out. See, the chariot does not get tired. The men and horses get tired. And the chariot is your tank. You don't want to lose that thing. So somebody gets wounded, you know, hurt, bring them back, swap out. They had chariot teams. NIV got it wrong. He killed 700 of their charioteers and 7,000 of their charioteers. There's a clear contradiction. Most of the new Bible versions that I'm aware of have some real serious contradictions built in. I'm not aware of any in the King James. The Bible says in Genesis 10, these are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues. So the languages are divided in chapter 10. But you read chapter 11, it says the whole earth was of one language. When I debated Farrell Till, who's the editor of an um, atheist magazine up in Illinois, he said, oh, the Bible's got a contradiction. Chapter 10 says the languages were divided up, and chapter 11 says the whole world's of one language. See, the Bible's wrong. Farrell... Chapter 11 is recapping, like giving a headline. Suppose you saw the headlines in the paper, 10 children killed in school bus accident. Then you start reading the article, and it says, the bus was driving down Highway 12. You say, wait, I thought, I thought they had a wreck. Yeah, the headline is summarizing the story, and now they're going back and giving the details, okay? 
Chapter 10 summarizes the story, and chapter 11 is going through and giving some of the details. Not a contradiction. Here's another supposed contradiction. How many died in the plague? Numbers 25 says, those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. When you read the story in 1 Corinthians, it says there fell in one day 3 and 20,000. Well, which is it? 24,000 died in the plague, according to Numbers, or is it 23,000 died in the plague? Well, again, read it carefully. No contradiction. How many died in the plague? 24,000. How many died in one day? 23,000. Well, 1,000 died the next day from the same plague. It's not a contradiction at all. So we go through in our college class quite a few of the supposed contradictions in the Bible. If you think there are some, you can uh, contact our office on our, uh, um, during our radio program. We have all kinds of time. We can take an hour and a half question every day on questions, supposed contradictions in the Bible or questions on creation or evolution.